So one of my fondest memories from childhood is my visit to the Royal Dahl Museum and his house, along with the famous caravan, uh, back when the latter features were actually open to the public. The museum featured everything from like this giant peach that I could wander inside to a chocolate factory tubes that were conveniently child-sized. I, like millions of others, loved Roald Dahl's works. My favourite being Matilda, obviously, and the witches, and actually his revolting rhyme poetry collection. Unfortunately, as it seems to be the theme concerning authors of beloved storybook series, the innocent charm of chocolate peaches and marvellous medicine wore off as I grew older and I learned more about the man behind the pen. Turns out that one of my favourite childhood authors, uh, a man whose works inspired, enthralled and comforted me, uh, was a renowned racist, anti-Semitic, potentially Nazi sympathiser, who was an absolute asshole to everyone around him. And he didn't keep it a secret either. And sometimes, if we read his books a particular way, it was written right in front of us. Hello everyone and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia. And if you're not new here and you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. Today's video is brought to you by Patreon. And today we are going to have a, a look into the dark side of one of my favorite authors as a child, Roald Dahl. But before we get into that, I just want to make a quick shout out to say, Thank you. I actually hit 100,000 subscribers. I say that there is a potential that when the time this video goes up, I will be under 100,000 subscribers, as there seems to be a YouTube glitch that's existed for many years now, in which within 30 seconds of me uploading a video, I lose between 50 and 70 subscribers immediately. So there's a potential that I've just gone under 100,000 subscribers, but here is proof that I was actually at 100,000 subscribers and I'd like to thank you so much to my patrons for making this possible and for all of you for subscribing. I really appreciate it. And if you're not subscribed, please consider so. And to celebrate 100,000 subscribers, I'm actually doing a live stream over on this channel. I normally live stream on my other channel, but we will have a live stream this Saturday on my channel. So check it out in the subscription box. I'll have it, you know, scheduled so you can sign up if you want to. And we'll just have a bit of a tea party and chat to celebrate 100k. But now let's get into the, the dark, tricky side of Roald Dahl, which is fascinating to read about, honestly. So first, let's start a bit with the lighter stuff. You know, the stuff that isn't so serious in the grand scheme of things. And that's the rather adult nature of Dahl's work. It's no secret to any of us who read his works in depth that he was pretty cheeky and quite adult. And I think even as a child, I was aware that there was something a little bit raunchy going on or a little bit naughty happening. So a few of Roald Dahl's books have actually been banned from libraries across the world, be they school libraries, public libraries, etc. For, in my opinion, quite silly reasons. I mean, the first one is The Witches. The Witches was actually banned from some libraries across England because, get this, um, perceived misogyny. So there's a quote in the book that says, I do not wish to speak badly about women, but most women are lovely. But the fact remains that all witches are women. There is no such thing as a male witch. On the other hand, a ghoul is always a male. Both are dangerous, but neither of them is half as dangerous as a real witch. To me, to call that misogynistic is a little bit tenuous. I read much worse about women. That to me is more about the idea that witches were women in fairy tales and all that jazz. It doesn't scream misogyny, but there we go. Another reason why The Witches was actually banned in quite a few libraries is that some believe that it promoted suicide. You see, the film is very different from the end of the book. In the film, the little boy, Luke, gets turned back into a human, but in the end of the book, uh, Luke actually chooses to remain a mouse because he can't bear to outlive his grandmother. So he gives himself nine years left to live and he thinks that's a good timing for his grandmother's death as well. It's a little bit dark, I will admit, but it's more about, in my opinion, the idea of him having, this is his only life, but some parents believe that it promoted the idea of, you know, Additionally, James and the Giant Peach was challenged by parents for its drug and alcohol references, as in it there is a rhyme that the centipede sings to James, which goes, Once upon a time when the pigs were swine and the monkeys chewed tobacco, and the hens took snuff to make themselves tough, and the duck said quack quack quacko, and the porcupines drank fiery wines. So the song is obviously inspired by the clapping song by Shirley Erelis. Um, 
But some people believe that it was a little bit taboo to mention any kind of drugs and tobacco and things like that. Clearly, they haven't sat through Pinocchio, but okay. And actually, only just a few years ago, I say that, I think it was around 2014, in Australia, supermarkets withdrew stocking Dahl's Revolting Rhymes, one of my favourite books, um, after parents started complaining that in the Cinderella poem, uh, there is a line that says, The prince cried, Who's this dirty slut? Off with her nut, off with her nut. It wasn't, yeah, Dahl wasn't exactly quiet with certain terms, and I do distinctly remember reading that poem out loud quite a lot. Parenting was very different in the 90s. And who else remembers the backlash when Penguin Classics released this edition of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? People were outraged, claiming that the book looked more like Lolita, and some even argued that the creepy cover sexualised the nature of the book. There's no need to sexualise Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with the cover, one Twitter user wrote. Dahl was dark, but not that dark. Well, actually, he was. You see, one of the questions readers of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory were left asking themselves at the end of the book was, what is a snozberry? When the children were touring Wonka's factory, they came across a wall plastered with flavoured wallpaper. Wonka encourages them to taste it, excitedly telling them, lick an orange, it tastes like an orange. The strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. No one knew what a snozberry was until Dahl published his adult book, My Uncle Oswald, 15 years later. And that's when we all found out it's a penis. My Uncle Oswald is all about Oswald Hendricks Cornelius, the greatest fornicator of all time, who teams up with a sexy accomplice, Yasmin Homecomely. Together, they devise a complicated get-rich-quick scheme that involves Yasmin seducing Europe's most famous men and then selling their condoms full of their spent semen to women wishing to birth famous progeny. When explaining how she seduced Bernard Cornwall Shaw, the following dialogue takes place. How did you manage to roll the old rubbery thing on him? There's only one way when they get violent, Yasmin said. I grabbed hold of his snozberry and hung onto it like a grim death and gave it a twist or two to make him hold still. Dahl had the most vivid childlike imagination. He was capable of tapping into a child's taste of fear, humour and magic. He was a modern day Grimm's fairy tale writer. From wives who fed their husbands worms to incredible chocolate factories, witches who turned children into mice, and a headmistress who spun little girls by their pigtails and threw them into nail studded punishment cupboards, Dahl had the gift for writing that fairy tale esque enchantment that we all crave from books, and ones that tap into our visceral need for tales that dance the fine line between darkness and delight. From the dark realities of the stories behind childhood nursery rhymes, like Ringa Ringa Roses or Oranges and Lemons, to the gruesome fairy tales, darkness is something children are reared on. And it's an important part of children's literature. As child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim explained in his seminal study, The Uses of Enchantment, the macabre in children's literature serves an important cathartic function. Without such fantasies, the child fails to get to know his monster better, nor is he given suggestions as to how he may gain mastery over it. As a result, the child remains helpless with his worst anxieties, much more so than if he had been told fairy tales which give these anxieties form and body, and also show ways to overcome these monsters. However, aside from the parental fusses over inappropriate language, tenuous misogyny and references to drugs and alcohol, Dahl's books are far more innocent than his very concerning personal ideologies and beliefs, most of which were edited out by his editor. So racism showcases itself throughout several of Dahl's books, but the most glaring was censored very early on. Dahl's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was inspired by Dahl's own life as a boy at a prestigious British boarding school in 1930s. You see, one day, the Chocolate Factory, Cadbury's, had the school's pupils test its new chocolates, a job Dahl took very seriously and dreamed of becoming a chocolate maker one day. So Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory's plot centres around the real-life issue of industrial espionage, in which a rival chocolatier asks the children winners of the golden tickets to smuggle out Willy 
Wonka's latest creation. Willy Wonka is a mystical, mysterious man who has remained closed off from the public, and the factory itself seems, to the outside viewer, to be run by magic. Nobody ever goes in, and nobody ever comes out. It is only when the lucky children and their guardians go inside the factory that they discover the factory isn't run by magic at all, but rather the Oompa Loompas, small people from Loompaland, a region of Loompa, which is a small isolated island in the Hang Doodles. Yes. The Oompa Loompas came with Willy Wonka because they were at risk of being eaten by the Wang Doodles, which preyed on them. In exchange for being saved from their terrible homeland, the Oompa Loompas agreed to work and live in his factory for the rest of their lives. And we can already see where this idea has come from. It's no secret that cocoa plantations that supplied Cadbury and other chocolate makers use enslaved labour, or largely did so at the day, but the story of the Oompa Loompas was actually much worse in the original first edition of the book. You see, in the first edition of the book, they weren't Oompa at all, they were actually African pygmy people who came from, quote, the very deepest and darkest part of the African jungle, where no white man has ever been before. And you won't be surprised to hear that this blatant colonial stereotyping of the white saviour and his happy slaves uh, wasn't challenged until 1971, when the NAACP launched a protest against the book being made into a film. In response, Dahl was shocked and sullen, journalist Leila Eplett writes. He found the NAACP to be unreasonable, telling Knopf editor Bob Bernstein that he was unable to understand why they perceived his story to be a terrible, dastardly anti-Negro book, and described their attitude as real Nazi stuff. We can see a lot of overlays. Times don't change, do they? So it wasn't until the 1974 edition that the Oompa Loompas became long-haired, rosy-cheeked, uh, white little people that came from Oompa Land rather than the African jungle. But it's not just Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, the grasshopper in James and the Giant Peach uh, likes to stress his dislike for Mexicans in a very strange, random sentence. He claims that I would rather be fried alive than eaten by Mexicans, which I'm assuming is more to do with diet. So there was a lot of going around that Dahl was racist, and in 2017, they seemed to be trying to clean up Dahl's image. His widow, Felicity Dahl, tried to refute the claims of his racism in an interview with BBC. BBC Radio 4 today, alongside Dahl's biographer Donald Sturrock. So Felicity claimed that the titular character of Charlie the Chocolate Factory was actually initially black, so Dahl couldn't be racist at all. He wanted his protagonist to be a little black boy, but it was his darn agents who said that Charlie Bucket needed to be portrayed as white because of concerns of having a black hero. However, such sentiments are somewhat undercut by research done by literary historians such as Donald Yakovone, an associate at Harvard University Hutchkin Center for African and African American Research, who, in 2018, highlighted the racist depictions employed in the early draft of the BFG. Yakovone explains how Dahl's first draft of the BFG, the friendly giant at the centre of the book, emerged originally as the very worst imitation of a Zip Coon figure, a black, flat-nosed giant with, quote-unquote, thick, rubbery lips, like two gigantic purple frankfurters lying on top of each other. This was going to be what the BFG looked like until an editor actually spoke up. And this editor, Stephen Roxborough, later edited also The Witches and Matilda. And this editor denounced Dahl's characterization as a derisive stereotype. Dahl conceded to the point of responding, quote, the Negro lip sting has been taken care of. So then we come on to the interesting topic of anti-Semitism. The largest thing that Dahl is known for. Uh, but there's also some interesting discussions about how it creeps into his books. So, Dahl's children's books aren't considered to be notably anti-Semitic. However, his publishers, especially the longtime editor Stephen Ruxborough, are credited with cutting the racist and misogynistic content from most of the famous stories, uh, including the witches, you know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and the BFG. However, the anti-Semitism found in the witches today is much more subtle and would have gone unnoticed, and it's only some literary theorists who believe it's symbolic of anti-Semitism. You see, The Witches tells the story of a brave young boy and his Norwegian grandmother as a battle against England's filthy rich, large-nosed, child-hating witches who want to turn all children into mice, and this plan, many literary critics have argued, is rooted in a very old and hateful anti-Semitic trope, the blood libel. 
See, the term blood libel refers to the false allegation that Jews use the blood of non-Jewish, usually Christian, children for ritual purposes. Blood libels, together with the allegations of well poisoning, were a major theme in the Jewish persecution in Europe throughout the Middle Ages and into the modern period, especially by the Nazis, who made effective use of the blood libel charge in their anti-Semitic propaganda. The witches were simply rolling in money thanks to a machine that printed banknotes for their own use. And this leads into a lot of anti-Semitic claims that the Jewish people run the bank in secret and they run the whole economic system of the world. You know what we're talking about. And to say Dahl was anti-Semitic isn't a stretch of the imagination because Dahl laid bare his anti-Semitism, espousing a belief in the cable of powerful and rich Jewish finances running the world and possibly even sympathising with the Nazis. You see, in 1983, Dahl declared in The New Statesman that Hitler had reasons for exterminating six million men, women and children. He said, and I quote, there is a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. I mean, there's always a reason why anti-anything crops up anywhere. Even a stinker like Hitler didn't pick on them for no reason. He even espoused the conspiracy theory that powerful American Jewish bankers were in charge of the US at every level, claiming the country was utterly dominated by the greatest Jewish financial institutions there. In 2018, The Guardian reported that the British Royal Mint had rejected a proposal to mark the 100th anniversary of Dahl's birth when a commemorative coin due to the fact he was associated with anti-Semitism and not regarded as an author of the highest reputation. So then, in what was arguably a preemptive move against criticism for their upcoming projects, including a $1 billion Netflix deal, which gave them the rights to 16 of the author's works, the Roald Dahl Story Company issued a quiet apology in 2020 for the author's anti-Semitism. And then we're getting more into the personal life of Dahl, uh, and we're talking about Patricia Neal, his first wife. In 1965, Patricia had a brain hemorrhage, causing a stroke that nearly killed her. She underwent an operation to stop the bleeding, and the left half of her brain was damaged. She was unable to talk, and her right side was paralysed, though gradually things began to improve. The reason I'm telling you about this is that there are two sides to this story. Many people praise Dahl for his treatment of his first wife, Patricia, but there's some also little tenuous things that people criticise him for, so let's get into it. You see, as Patricia had difficulty remembering words and names of people after her strokes, she began to make up words to replace what she meant, which was later reflected in actually the BFG's gobblefunk language. So when the BFG explains the gobblefunk language, they believe it's actually Patricia explaining it. He says, I know exactly what words I'm wanting to say, but somehow or other they are always getting squiff squiddled around. What I mean and what I say is two different things. But when he was confronted with the idea that the BFG sounded very much like his first wife after her strokes, he then kind of conceded that he may have picked up some of the things that she said and put it in the book. That's not an abrasive accusation by any means, authors get their inspiration from everywhere, uh, but the way Dahl is praised for his wife uh, goes against what most people in his personal life know. There's always some good to every bad side, and many credit Dahl for the work he did into rehabilitating Patricia, and that credit is due. You see, at the time, the medical advice in 1965 was that people who, after having suffered strokes, would do rehabilitation, but one hour a day was enough, according to the medical advice at the time, and Dahl, afraid that Patricia would, quote, become an enormous pink cabbage, set up an intensive six hours a day regimen to rehabilitate Patricia. Patricia. And this worked. Patricia went on to resume her acting career and even earn another Oscar nomination. Dahl's work with Patricia then inspired other stroke survivors and their families, so much so that with the help of a neighbour of his, Valerie Eaton Griffith, Dahl wrote a guide about the methods he employed to rehabilitate Patricia. And this went on to inspire a whole new movement in the formation of the Stroke Association. So that's awesome work there. And Dahl is also heroic in many other ways. In 1939, following the outbreak of World War II, he was enlisted in the Royal Air Force and served as a fighter pilot before suffering severe injuries to his head, nose and back in a plane crash in the Libyan desert. In the summer of 1941, he was stationed in Haifa, Israel. 
and Dahl began to suffer debilitating headaches and was thus unable to fly. So he returned to Britain to live out with his mother in Buckinghamshire. Though he was unable to serve as a pilot, Dahl became useful in other ways. You see, he was a six foot six, strapping, charming man, which made him perfect for persuading isolationist America to join the Allied forces in the fight against Germany. Yes. Dahl was sent to the British Embassy in Washington DC as an assistant air attaché in the spring of 1942 and was subsequently recruited as an undercover agent for the British security coordination. And Dahl served as a very successful spy and womanizer who was basically the James Bond of his time but not as daring. But sadly his resourcefulness and intelligence are clouded by how he treated people in his life and his prejudice and hateful views on people that he was not only just open about but subtly he slipped into the pages of his work. In her autobiography As I Am, written four years after her divorce from Dahl in 1987, Patricia Neal, who referred to Dahl as Roald the Rotten, exposed her true feelings towards her ex-husband, claiming he was rude, arrogant and disloyal, and he regularly belittled her during their marriage. And yes, Dahl was known as a womanizer. He had multiple affairs. When he was a spy, he slept with many women who were married, and during his marriage, he also had multiple affairs. The sentiments of his character were also later echoed by his daughter, Tessa Dahl, who in a 2012 interview accused Dahl of selfish and egocentric behavior and stated that, daddy gave joy to millions of children, but I was dying inside. Additionally, in an unauthorized biography of Dahl, British literary historian Jeremy Treglone described Dahl as a boaster, liar, and bully, who had an extensive sexual affairs with many women whilst working as a spy in the US and avoided paying tax by setting up fraudulent companies abroad. Then we have to think about his publishers. This is quite funny. So for almost 20 years, his New York publisher was Alfred A. Kompf. Now in his memoir, Avid Reader, Robert Gottlieb, who was top brass there in 1963 to 1987, wrote a little bit about working with Dahl. Robert wrote, his behavior to the staff was so demanding and rude that no one wanted to work with him. And in any case, there was no one there who was elevated enough for him to deign to deal with. Rold was a tremendous character, but his behavior at Comp grew more and more erratic and churlish. Secretaries were treated like servants, tantrums were thrown both in person and in letters, and when Bob Bernstein, the head of Random House, didn't accede to his immoderate and provocative financial demands, we sensed anti-Semitic undertones in his angry response. See, the last nail in the coffin between Dahl and his American publisher was strangely, all over um, pencils. According to Jeremy Treglone's biography of Dahl, in 1980, the writer sent a letter to Robert's office to tell him that he was running out of pencils, specifically Dixon to Conderoga, 1388, 2 to 5 10 medium. And he requested that Robert have someone competent and ravishing send him a packet of six dozen his way. Robert thought he was joking, so he ignored him. Then three months later, Dahl wrote again, and finally, Robert's assistant wrote back, sending the closest thing that she could find to these pencils. These pencils were apparently not sufficient, and in addition to the pencils, Dahl's had a slew of other complaints and demands. He wrote again, threatening to take his books elsewhere. So, Robert replied, Dear Rold, this is not the response to the specifics of your last several letters to me and my colleagues, but a general response to everything we've heard from you in the past year or two. In brief, and as unemotionally as I can state it, since the time when you decided that Bob Bernstein and I and the rest of us had dealt badly with you and your contract, you've behaved to us in a way that I can honestly say is unmatched in my experience for overbearingness and utter lack of civility. Lately, you've begun addressing others here who are less well placed to answer you back with the same degree of abusiveness. For a while, I put your behavior down to the physical pain you were in and so managed to excuse it. Now I've come to believe that you're just enjoying a prolonged tantrum and are bullying us. Your threat to leave Knops after this current contract is fulfilled leaves us far from intimidated. Harrison Bernstein and I will be sorry to see you depart for business reasons, but these are not strong enough to make us put up with your manner to us any longer. I've worked hard for you editorially, but had already decided to stop doing so. Indeed, you've managed to make the entire experience of publishing you unappealing for all of us. Counterproductive behavior, I would have thought. To be perfectly clear, let me reverse your threat. Unless you start acting civilly to us, there is no possibility of our agreeing to continue to publish you. Nor will I, or any of us, 
answer any future letter that we consider to be as rude as those we've been receiving. Regretfully, BG. Apparently, when he sent the letter, um, all of Dahl's contacts at the office stood on their desks and cheered. Needless to say, Dahl wasn't a popular or liked man. Frankly, he was detested by the vast majority of people who knew him. Yet his books remain legendary. I wouldn't be the person I am today having not devoured Matilda and the Revolting Rhymes, but I'm no worse off for reading his works. Whilst he's not a man who I'd financially support were he alive today, I'll continue to read and love his books. Weirdly, I feel like they made me a better person. I feel like they informed my moral judgement. They encouraged me to not judge others and be kind to others because good always prevails, even if the road to victory is a little more violent than the Disney films and fairy tales would have me believe. See Little Red Riding Hood who whipped the pistol from her knickers and shot the wolf dead. Thank you again for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was more the history of an author, but I found it fascinating and wanted to write about it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and liking the video. And thank you again to my Patreons for supporting my content. If you'd like to consider my being a Patreon, the links are all down below. But thank you, Patreons, and thank you to everyone for helping me get to 100,000 subscribers. I genuinely appreciate it. Our 12 years on the platform, I finally made it. I should have given up years ago, but I didn't. The signs were all there, but it shows you that slow and steady eventually becomes mediocre in the end. And that's what I strive for. Remember, I live stream three times a week over on my other channel. So if you do work from home or study with me, please go join me over there. I also have a podcast that comes out every week. The link is in the bio. It's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And until next week, I shall see you soon. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.